Welcome back to the Investing on the Go podcast brought to you by Fund Caliber. This week, we explore the current state of the global macro economy with nuanced perspectives on interest rates, inflation, fiscal policy, and monetary policy. I'm James Yardley, and today I'm joined by Everson Y, one of the managers of the M&G Global Macro Bond Fund. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So, Eva, um, I mean, yours is a is a global macro fund. So let's start with the the macro economy. Um, it's been an interesting year. Where, where do you see where the world is now, and, and where are we going? What is your sort of broad ma- macro framework at the moment? It's definitely been an interesting year. I think you know when I look back at the end of 2022, and we had lots of 2023 forecasts coming out we had probably a lot more doom and gloom i think you know the the consensus was more for a recession or slowdowns to start hitting western economies um towards the latter part of this year we knew that hiking cycles were you know kind of in the middle and we were likely going to see those come to an end but the impact of them was was really unknown and we've now had a year where actually economies especially in the US have held up pretty resiliently. Um, In the US especially, we have still, you know, that debate on soft landing versus hard landing. It's difficult to to know if that recession is actually, you know, coming. And I think markets have grappled with that in the bond space in terms of what that means for interest rates, what it means for inflation, um, what it means for fiscal policy as well as monetary and I feel like this year we've 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 very much seen three phases of higher yields in developed markets. Phase one being higher inflation expectations, so higher inflation break-evens, which is market expectations of inflation. Phase two was more falling break-evens, falling inflation expectations, and we had flattening of curves. So we had very inverted yield curves whereby the front end was yielding more than the long end, which is historically a sign of recession. Phase three seems to be steeper yield curves. So we have more term premium being priced into the long end, which is essentially investors demanding higher yields for taking on longer dated borrowing, which is... If we just uh, explain that to the listeners, I guess, I mean... I mean, histor- uh, traditionally, I guess you'd expect to be compensated for for being invested in a longer bond. So, yes, a ten-year bond, say a two-year bond, is, historically should have a higher yield, I guess, and that's what you're talking about when you're talking about term premium, there, isn't it? But exactly. recently, the yield curve has actually been inverted the other way. So you're getting a higher yield on your two-year bond, say, relative to your ten-year, and, and as you say, that's historically a sign of recession. And yet that recession hasn't come yet. So I guess where where are we going now? I guess I mean, are you in this higher for longer camp and that we have to keep these interest rates much higher and that we're in a new era now um, from where we were a few years ago? Or, or do we now see inflation and rates fall back to where they were? Um, yeah, I think you know the higher for longer narrative has really has really gripped markets for a long part of this year. Personally, I actually, if you if you're talking about the opposite of lower for longer, we're actually talking about higher for shorter. And I think that's more the camp that that I'm in. We are a little bit more uh hard landing, a little bit more recessionary in our expectations. You know, in my view, if you hike over 500 basis points in the space of about a year, a year and a half, you will likely see pain in the real economy. In my view, the transmission mechanisms are clearly quite slow. And I think when we talk about the US, if we think about one of the key ways in which that is transmitted into the economy, it's through the mortgage market. In the US, the average, you know, you you have a much longer average length of maturity. Loss of maturities in the US are 30 year fixed compared to the UK or, you know, we're looking at Sweden at the beginning of the year, which has an average of about a year and a half. So much, much shorter. And you started to see house prices drop off in Sweden much earlier in the year. It's not just through house prices, obviously, but one of the the, the main mechanisms in which, you know, economies slow down is through that mortgage market. And you would assume 
if you're starting to see people need to take out new mortgages or need to refinance and they and not want to and therefore you know stay where they are that limits economic activity it limits all the extra things you have when you move house you're not then you know buying a new car in your new environment you're not you know buying new furniture you're not spending money in a new place so all of those there's lots of multiplier effects that come through that limited economic activity if we look at the UK we've been a lot of we've we've been looking at a lot of calculations it's actually estimated that less than half of the pass through has happened from higher interest rates into the mortgage market and considering less than half and we have much shorter mortgage tenors so that makes me think that there's still more pain to come here over half which makes me think there's probably the majority still to come in the US it's clear that the timing has been you know very uncertain but in my view if you hike that aggressively that quickly in an in an economy that is not used to it right we're not used to levels you know higher levels of interest rates than we've seen in recent decades we've had lower for longer for a long time so in my view that the economy you know is being very resilient but i think it's all a little bit optimistic in my view interesting so how are you playing that then when it comes to the portfolio does that mean that you expect interest rates to fall faster in the uk and europe and therefore do you prefer um say gilts over over treasuries um and are you also playing currencies in that respect as well as a separate question after that i mean does that mean you expect you know the dollar to be stronger if if rates are going to have to be higher in the us i think we've actually got to a point now where because we've we've seen bond valuations get to such high levels across the board i think there's a lot of opportunity not just in the uk and europe but treasuries you know aside from the recent rally we've had in november um we were hitting you know 5% in long dated bonds which is pretty you know remarkable considering considering the backdrop and so for us actually we we like uh, us treasuries as well as gilts and bunds but we want to be selective and so you know as i've said we we are positioned for more of a hard landing scenario but we want to keep room to continue to add duration if we see the higher for longer narrative continue to take hold and we see yields creep higher i think we've probably seen the peak now but i think we're likely to perhaps see a bit of consolidation into ranges as opposed to you know continued sharp rallies that we've seen over november um especially going into kind of the christmas season where liquidity drops off you'd expect probably these bonds to trade more in a range as opposed to continue a very very strong rally um but in 2024 i'd expect markets to start pricing in rate cuts a little bit more we are you know i i think we 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 we're, we're not far off you know we're sort of pricing in q2 q3 across a couple of markets i don't think that's that's unreasonable some people think that's too soon i think that will probably end up happening you also have to consider you know fiscal positions governments and central banks i don't think are that comfortable with rates this high given they have refinancing to you know to deal with and to answer your currency question again yes we do play currencies and we again want to remain selective so when i say we're more you know hard landing we're not positioning for complete doomsday complete doomsday positioning would be max long duration would be long dollar would be absolutely no risk assets and i don't think we're there yet i don't think markets are there yet and i don't think valuations are there yet across the board so we do have exposure to, you know we have room to add more duration and we do have exposure to other currencies and those where we believe there's still value emerging markets is a good example whereby we have de-risked on a portfolio level but within emerging markets there are still very high real yields whereby that means inflation adjusted yields which are very attractive in certain emerging markets because they hiked prematurely to developed markets so they got inflation down quickly and rates have remained high that means the carry you're getting from the currencies so imagine you put your money in a brazilian bank you're being paid very very well in interest rates to hold that foreign currency so there are some elements of the market that we still like and so we're not completely positioned for doomsday 
um, but we are being more selective in where we are taking risk at the moment. And as you said, this fund is a macro fund. It's very flexible. And so we can do that in a variety of ways through government bonds, inflation linked bonds, credit, emerging markets, derivatives. So there's, you know, lots going on under the surface, but broadly the funds have begin, began to de-risk. And so where are you in terms of government bonds versus corporate bonds? I mean, are you preferring govies at the moment then? Uh, have you taken down your, your corporate bonds or maybe your high yield weight? Yes. If you look at, you know, corporate spreads at the moment, we're, we're, we're seeing pretty tight levels. You know, I don't think we're at we're at max tightness, but we are seeing, in my view, quite uncompelling spread levels for the economic backdrop. The difference is, though, if you look at the all-in yields, you are seeing very attractive all-in yields in the credit space, especially in investment grade. So high yield, we don't have much exposure to because we don't believe that, you know, going into a recessionary environment, we want to be holding high yield. But certain investment grade names, if you look at, you know, a corporate bond, it's comprised of an underlying risk free rate and the corporate spread on top. You look at spreads versus the government bonds, of course. But at the moment, so much of that yield is being driven by the underlying risk free rate that the all in yields are very, very attractive. So given the spreads aren't as attractive, we would prefer broadly to hold the government bonds so hold the underlying risk free rate. But where we believe there are certain you know, industries, sectors, individual issuers that can weather a recessionary environment very well, we want to take advantage of those all-in yields and clip the carry from those bonds. And that's where you know, at M&G, we have a very large uh, credit research team, et cetera. And, and, and there, that resource is super valuable in this kind of environment. So where, there is, where we see value in corporate bonds, we will hold them. I'll buy them, but broadly, if you look at what's comprising that all in yield, government bonds relatively look more attractive in my view. And do you have a strong view on bonds versus equities at the moment? I mean, where are we with bonds now? I mean, we've had this incredible bull run for 30 years and now a really painful period for the last few years. I mean, can bonds really work as an asset class going forward? And, and, and yeah, do you have a view of them versus equity? Currently, I mean, I won't speak to equity because obviously I'm a bond investor and, and I'll probably embarrass myself. But I do think we're in, entering a phase where, you know, the prospect of bond returns outstripping equity returns in 2024 is a real possibility. If I look at six month US government bonds versus the S&P 500, if you compare earnings yields on both, we're actually seeing higher yields from six-month treasuries than from the S&P 500. Now, naturally, there is a, a duration mismatch there. You would have to assume that you were re-rolling the six-month bond every six months at that same mature at that same yield um, to get the same overall return. But broadly, what what it's showing is to essentially buy a risk-free asset, a six-month T-bill, you are getting paid more than you know the 500 largest market cap corporates in America which is pretty wild if you if you really think you know stop and think about it so in in my view valuations for bonds are just you know very very attractive you are very cushioned at this point you know we're talking about oh well what if we don't have a recession what if the soft landing continues what if rates continue to creep higher it's very hard to time that exact entry point in you know and when you expect us a pivot in the market or a pivot in central bank policy or in market views but broadly you are very cushioned at this point you know you're if you're buying bonds at 5% here higher than equity indices you're giving yourself you know a decent amount of protection and what are the other big themes going on in the portfolio at the moment i think you usually have around 4 to 6 uh, themes. So what are the yep. main main ideas? Yep. You know, as I said, broadly de-risking, but still being selective across across credit and emerging markets, um, sitting slightly long duration now across your core markets. I think one of the key themes that is pretty uncorrelated to the others is our view on Japan. Um, Japan is a space where 
when I talk about developed market economies, I'm sort of talking ex Japan because they're in a completely different monetary and economic landscape. Um, we don't like Japanese duration. We do like the currency, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but broadly, you know, we think the Bank of Japan still has quite a way to go in terms of adjusting monetary policy. And even if they don't adjust monetary policy, you know, even if they don't exit negative interest rate policy, your downside of not holding those bonds is pretty low, given, you know, earlier in the year, we had the 10 year at 25 basis points, we had, you know, front end, essentially negatively yielding. So not holding those bonds, your, your downside is very, very limited in case those bonds were, were to rally, you know, the, the fr- they have a flaw, right? For us, we do, I went out to visit Tokyo in, in April, met with, met with officials, met with Ministry of Finance, etc. And it was quite clear that they were very uncomfortable with the prospect of more sustained domestic inflation in Japan. But if you look at the underlying data, that prospect is still very real. It has stagnated slightly, but broadly, if you look, you know, uh, service sector inflation, if you look at underlying wage negotiations, that sort of thing, we are seeing more sustained inflation in Japan. We also have the, you know, the prospect of a weaker currency, you know, that that potentially imports inflation. We also have the prospect of higher oil prices and that sort of thing is is bad for Japan because they need to they're a big importer of oil etc so you know they they're under quite a bit of pressure um but we think broadly we have started to see you know some tightening of policy through yield curve control so they have currently been pinning the 10 year point of the curve and they do that by essentially buying the bonds uh, to keep yields capped and they've been doing that for a while at the 10 year They've started to relax that. So we've seen a widening of that band. So the tolerance level of the 10-year yield has got higher. That has helped the currency a bit, but not enough. And we think going forward, they will likely either completely abolish yield curve control. They probably have to do that before they exit negative interest rate policy, in our view. Um, And so going forward, we do think there are there is the possibility for higher Japanese bond yields and a stronger currency. So that is the position we have on that is quite different and quite uncorrelated to the rest of of the mark of the kind of themes in the portfolio because it's very reliant on the domestic Japanese economy. Having said that, I also it's hard to it's hard to have completely uncorrelated themes. But you know, for example, if the Fed were to cut, that would probably be yen positive because you'd have a weaker dollar. So, you know, not everything is uncorrelated, but broadly that view is based on potentially higher sustained inflation in domestic Japan. And heading into 2024, I mean, you've you've indicated you, you're more in the hard landing camp. I mean, are there any other strong views you have or anything you're, you're looking out for in particular next year? I think, you know, the talk of, of the last couple of months has very much been fiscal positions of of governments and central banks i think that dynamic is is going to be very interesting you know we have essentially much higher levels of debt to gdp than we've had in the past and that didn't matter so much in the past because interest rates were perpetually low so governments could continue to refinance at very low levels and it didn't really matter if they were pushing up their balance sheets and pushing up debt to gdp we're now in a phase where, you know, we have higher debt to GDP levels. I mean, Japan is again an outlier here because they're they're at two hundred and fifty percent broadly in in developed markets. We're sat around a hundred in most economies, um, and you know we're coming up to to a year when we have refinancing and we have you know to think about the debt loads of governments and markets have reacted very positively. To, to the US, for example, coming out and saying actually we're going to borrow a bit less than we thought we would next year. And that's been market positive. Um, but broadly, you know, the, the fiscal positions of, of central banks and governments, I think, will be a very interesting dynamic to watch next year because, you know, what's what's the alternative? They either need to improve growth, which, you know, they can't do if they are cutting taxes or cutting spending to try and improve those ratios. You know, we we're still not back at target for inflation. So we're not, 
we don't think central banks are quite in a position to start cutting to boost that growth. You know, it's quite difficult to government for governments to inflate away their debt to GDP. So I don't think I think it's as it's you know massively problematic because governments always and central banks always have tools and you know things they can they can use and ways they can they can refinance. But I think the fiscal versus monetary dynamic is is a very interesting one going forward. Definitely something to keep an eye on. Well, thank you very much uh, for joining us today, Eva. It's always great to hear from a, a macro specialist. So, um, and that was a really fascinating discussion. Thank you for having me. M&G Global Macro Bond is a go-anywhere bond fund. The team of managers use their considerable skill to take a view on macroeconomic conditions and combine this with their stock-picking ability to create a portfolio that should benefit from both long-term trends and short-term tactical investments. To learn more about the M&G Global Macro Bond Fund, please visit fundcaliber.com. And don't forget to subscribe to the Investing on the Go podcast available wherever you get your podcasts. Please remember, we've been discussing individual companies to bring investing to life for you. It's not a recommendation to buy or sell. The fund may or may not still hold these companies at the time of listening. Elite ratings are based on Fund Calibre's research methodology and are the opinion of Fund Calibre's research team only. 